for family, friends, and anyone who wants to go on a uh, slow-moving fiber adventure, you are welcome here. Um, We are currently experiencing the very, very beginnings, the gentle beginnings of a blizzard. I I don't think those words go well together, (laughs) but we are experiencing exactly that, no matter how apropos it is. So right now, the snow is just at don't know if you can see it but it's just gently drifting down uh, there is almost no light outside so I apologize in advance if you can't see things or if things are a little darker than they should be uh, but we are supposed to starting this afternoon receive a gentle two to five inches of snow and then by tomorrow morning we are supposed to have 10 plus inches of snow. So within 24 hours, we are expected to get roughly another foot of snow on top of the already still foot of and a half of snow we already have. Um, if you saw my Instagram post, you know that we already have had two blizzards already this year, which have each dumped between eight inches to 16 inches on top of us at a time. and. Over the past week, we went up to about 45 degrees and back down to negative 21. So that was exciting and we are expecting to experience the same thing. I don't know if you know this, but scientifically speaking, the colder it is, the more snow you get. I don't know if this is true because what I have experienced in my life is that the more it goes back and forth, the more snow we get. It's a little rough going from positive 45 degrees to negative 21, but I guess we knew that moving here. (laughs) Um, I grew up in the north, so this isn't uncommon for me. It's something that was just always normal growing up. Um, For other people in other places, I have family who live in Florida and some who have lived in other places out in the west and Um, Colorado, California, New Mexico, that type of thing. Um, And I don't envy them their hot weather, but what I do envy them is um, the ability to drive places. Not that those places don't get snow or that those places don't have interesting weather unto themselves, but I feel as if Um, of all of my friends who are scattered throughout the um, continent of North America, we seem to have the most temperamental here, which is partly due to our elevation, Um, but it could be worse. And and I'm happy that even though there are extended baking times due to the elevation, it is a, a place where the wind is very crisp and it seems very, um, alive in the summer and it is uh, beautiful, dangerously, sparklingly beautiful um, in the winter. Where we are currently at, I know that spring is around the corner. In fact, I was, um, I just read an email or a little bit ago from someone and that lives in England currently and um, they said that they have crocuses which and sent me a beautiful picture of all these little living things and I just thought how amazing it is that um, someone on the other side of the pond is experiencing the beginnings of spring already. We have probably another two to three months. I have actually, living here, we have actually gotten snow in July. (laughs) 
Um, that was a that was an odd year. I uh, will give it to you for that. But it did happen, and it could happen again. You never know. Anyway, we are going to have a quick jump into what I'm reading because what better way to deal with beautiful winter weather or ugly, depending on how you think about it, <laughs> than to curl up with coffee and a good book. So, because I haven't seen you in, what, two months, two and a half months? Because I haven't seen you in a while, I have actually managed to finish several books. Um, one of which, or part of which, is part of a series. So, I was going to tell you a little bit about an author that I found. Uh, we were roaming around. I have this horrible thing that I do, and my family hates it. And please tell me if you're like this, because I don't want to be the only one. But um, whenever I go somewhere new, I immediately look for used bookstores in the area. And if there is one, I will somehow manage to find enough time in the trip to go there for at least an hour. A used bookstore requires a minimum of a good hour. And if, if you're really doing it right, it should take two plus hours to peruse a new to you used bookstore. That is my personal thought on the matter. But while I was there, I came across a set or part of a set of two books right here. So these are by Leanne. Hearn or Hearn, I'm not quite sure how she pronounces it, and this is part of the Tales of the, um, I believe it's pronounced Otori, but I could be correct. I'm probably wrong, let's face it. Um, but they caught my attention because they aren't glitzy, but they have nice covers, and um, they're part of a set. And I very rarely find um, full sets of books in bookstores anymore, so seeing book one and book two and reading the back and finding that it was something that looked intriguing to me, um, I picked it up. I didn't read it for the first, I would say the first year I had it. And I think I picked them up in late 2020, early 2022. And um, was started at once, put it down because I knew I was in a very busy point in life and knew I wasn't going to be able to read as much of it as I wanted to, and then picked it back up again. And oh my goodness, I am so happy that I did because these are excellent. Um, so Leanne Hearn, I'm just going to say it that way, apologies if it's wrong, um, is actually Jillian Rubenstein, uh, is, is her name, her, her, uh, pseudonym is Leanne Hearn, and she has been writing the series, um, the Tales series, for uh, since 2002, I want to say, is when the first book was published. I could probably look, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to go with my memory. <laughs> it's my own fault if I get it wrong, um, but I believe it came out in 2002, and she is a children's book author as well as a young adult author and uh, resides, I believe, in England and Australia as well. I think she, and she spent some time in Africa, I believe, if I remember correctly. But she has a, um, created a series that is just uh, brilliantly stunning in its, in its, the way that it captures I, I believe it's medieval Japan, but it's um, her own world that she's created. So she uses uh, Japanese culture and history as a background, but creates her own uh, series of events and characters and things like that. Although she does note that one of her characters is pulled from history. But it is a set of four books with one prequel, so five all together, and oh my goodness, when I picked these up, it says fantasy on the back. It, it defines itself as fiction. I, I'm sorry. It defines itself as fiction, not as fantasy, on the back. And it says it is selected for um, young adults and high school readers. These books are 
well beyond that anyone could read these and enjoy them. Um, they are they they step into the fantasy realm. Just that touch to make it um, even more intriguing, if you will. Um, I actually had the, I had to stop reading intentionally. I had to intentionally stop reading before I got to the next chapter. Like I had to stop in the middle of a chapter while reading these so that I could go to bed so that I could be a functional adult at work. Um, and <laughs> um, so it took me a little bit longer to get through these than it normally would, but it was there was never a point in time that I was bored. They are fascinating. Um, the way that she writes to me is reminiscent of Pearl Buck in that she's almost a little bit, um, she's almost a little bit detached from the character, even though she's writing in, maybe writing in a first person style. And yet it's so immersive in the character's experience. Um, the tone, the tone of the books is, um, very uh, sad, but engaging, uh, very, very well written and lyrical. The, the lyricism of these is just, it's beautiful. It makes you just want to keep reading her prose and to watch the characters grow and change and then solidify and, um, She's just done a wonderful job of, um, of of writing. She's she's just a stunning writer. So I am currently on the third book, which is Brilliance of the Moon, and I I'm I'm just into it. Just like I just started chapter one, and already I I don't want to marathon. Through, I want to savor this. I don't want to marathon through it, but I am so excited very excited to see what happens because her her plot is beautifully um balanced with tragedy and um adventure and politics in a very realistic way but that touch of, that touch of fantasy just adds just i don't even know what it adds i don't have the right word for it but it adds something that just makes this so deliciously edible. I'm going to read this series again in the future. I don't know when. It takes me forever to get back to books, but I keep the ones that I just want to enjoy over and over again. And the series I will be keeping, I will not be, I will be recommending it to others, but I will not be passing the books on um, because I am dreading, <laughs> I am literally dreading the ending to this series. It is just, I don't want to let it go. I don't want to let this world go or these characters or the uh, setting, the, the setting, just even the way that she describes the landscape and the, the style of living that I don't want to leave it alone. I just want to keep immersing myself in it. So if you can pick up a copy, if that's something that intrigues you, I'm not going to tell you anything about the plot other than it has many characters, but they are each, they don't meld together. You are not going to lose track of who is who because like when you work with a group of people in real life and they each have their own distinct and separate personality that just keeps growing and changing, but becomes so familiar to you. They're that like your, your second family. That's what she does with her cast of characters and she does an excellent job at it. So check her out. Um, her children's books are also highly lauded and awarded. So if you have kids, you might want to check out some of her kids' books. She also writes a huge range. Um, this particular series is set, like I said, in medieval Japan, but she has other series that she has written um, that are based off of like um, a gaming system the the plot is it's almost it reminded me a little bit of um, Alexander Key the and this the disappearing boy mixed with mm, 
mixed with Jumanji almost, it was that good. So your kids, they might enjoy reading some of her stuff too. If you have kids, if you have kids, you can read it. There is nothing wrong with reading children's books as an adult, and sometimes it is more fun than reading adult books as an adult. So, speaking of beautifully balanced, I wanted to show this to you because I think that you will appreciate it. And this is a recently acquired cup style supported spindle from Enid Ashcroft. So this is one of hers out of U, uh, Chak de Viga, and it has a brass tip. I don't know if you're going to be able to see it because you're a little far away from me today. It's just how the setup worked out. So it is 37 grams of gorgeousness. It is a little bit, a little bit over 10 inches long. And the whirl itself is somewhere around, you know, I would say an inch and a half, an inch and two thirds, somewhere, and it's somewhere in there but it is gorgeous. It's just a stunning spindle. Yew is one of those trees that it has such flavor and texture to it. I hope you can see this. I don't have any pictures of it yet, but it is stunning. And I think that I am going to join it in with my wound up fiber art spin that merino cashmere nylon spin that is just all this lovely fluffy fluffy goodness is the perfect spin I feel like for the spindle so it will join my other um, Enid Ashcroft and Oak Burr this is one of her I think this is one of her beads I want to say this is a bead style spindle but this is an Oak Burr and they both complement the fiber perfectly so they are going to make happy spinning music together and Somebody, okay, so Melly Knits on Instagram is just, she, first of all, she's stinking hilarious, but second, she is like a connoisseur of real fiber. She loves to spin. She spins on an e-spinner. Um, she is completely into fiber prep, but one of the things is her sister is into pottery, and she actually has her own business. I'll list it below because I cannot remember for the life of my, me right now what her name is but she was asking about um creating someone asked her about creating supported spindle wolves and i realized i had never really showed you mine and i don't have more than two with me because you know they're scattered all over the house everywhere but i received a comment and someone asked me what i use for my supported spindles and i figured i should just talk about it because why not? So I have two that I use, two or three that I use almost exclusively. And um, this one is the first one I ever got. This is by Mingo and Asho, and it is just straight up glass. And it's gorgeous. It's blue. It's got swirls in it, and it's thick, and it's heavy. Um, they are, you can almost always buy a sport supported spindle bowl from Mingo and Asho. Um, it is much, much harder to grab an actual glass pin spindle from them. But the reason I love theirs is they are quite shallow. The bowl itself is quite shallow. If you look, you can literally still see most of my finger. I think only, this is probably a quarter inch deep, maybe. Um, I love it because regardless of the um, width of the whirl, any spindle can be used in here. So it doesn't matter. This world could be three inches larger and I wouldn't be using it because it would be basically a Navajo style spindle and I would be using it accordingly. But it um, is perfectly sloped to contain anything. I would use, literally, I will use just about any spindle I have with this bowl because of the versatility of it. Um, however, glass is very smooth. I know this sounds like an obvious statement, but glass is very smooth. If you use a glass support bowl, everything in here is going to be very slick and it's going to spin 
very, very fast. If you like a lot of control, um, you might not like this as much. If you are someone who enjoys long draw, very long, very fast long draw, a glass support spindle bolt will work for you very well. Not saying you can't use it if you don't like long draw, but it it will make any spindle just whirl. So this Enid, this new Enid that I got, has a brass tip on it. The brass tip does nothing to hurt or harm the glass at all. In fact, I have found nothing hurts or harms this glass at all. But it does spin incredibly fast with this glass bowl. Um, when I first started out with supported spinning, I did not enjoy using a glass bowl. I actually, one of my, one of my supported spindles, um, was first supported spindles was from Main Fiber Arts, which is no longer in business and it had a wood tip. So much like the, um, spindle wild spindles, spindle wood, not wild, much like the spindle wood spindles, the end was just wood. Um, there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Uh, and I learned that I preferred when spinning with wood tip spindles to spin on ceramic because of Aaron Make Stuff. So Aaron Make Stuff, he has not done supported spindles for quite some time and he has not, to my knowledge, made spindle bowls for quite some time. But this is one of the first ones that I got from him. And you can see, I hope you can see, in the center there is a divot. And the bowl is far deeper than my Mingo and Asho glass spindle bowl. So one of the things that I love about this is if you have a very pointy spindle and you put it in here, it will still spin fast, almost as fast as the glass bowl will allow. However, this type of bowl prohibits something with a very thick, low pearl. I have a couple of uh, Merkwood Art spindles that I absolutely love from Tybor. And one of the things I love about his spindles is they have, um, they have a metal ball tip. And because of that, you can spin on them from just about any angle and they will keep spinning. However, I also prefer, personally, um, his larger whirl spindles. Um, I actually have a Bilbo spindle that is probably, uh, the whirl is probably about this thick, um, probably two or three times the circumference of this current spindle. And the ball tip is um, literally probably no more than two eighths of an inch before you're touching the whirl. So when you use it, you cannot use a bowl like this. The whirl will rub the sides of it. Um, so if you are looking into getting into supported spindles, or if you are wondering why they were frustrating you, you might want to take a look at the type of bowl that you use. Um, one of the things that I found that I liked with Tybor spindles is I preferred a wooden bowl with the metal ball tip um, for those specific spindles. The wood provides more drag in a lot of instances and I have a beautiful oak bowl from uh, Galena of Cherry Cherry that um, I, I didn't have with me because it's in a bag with a spinning project that I don't want to show you. <laughs> um, but that, that one um, helped me to learn how to spin um, with my Merkwoods. It was very, very fun to use and is still one of my go-tos, but I don't use my metal tipped, um, like my Enid Ashcroft spindles. They are um, pointy and uh, would, would possibly scratch uh, the wood surface of the bowl. And I don't even use my um, spindle wood spindles in, in a wood bowl because I am concerned about the tips wearing down faster. However, the Merkwoods just sing when they are put in that environment. And I find that when I want um, more of a controlled draft, draft and more of a controlled long draw, 
even I would say a um, supported long draw almost, I prefer to work with the wooden bowl and um, my Merkwoods. But for traditional long draw on a supported spindle, ceramic or glass, and these guys just whirl. They're just little dervishes, keep going and going and going. Um, a lot of beginners I find they don't um, know that what their materials are made up of will greatly influence how they spin um, and what they spin on. The Mingo and Asho, just like the Enids, are built for speed and are gorgeous, gorgeous tools to work with. And they are for spinners, they're for any spinner because you can make any spindle do anything. But if you love to spin fast and get a large amount of fiber, you need the good tools like these with the right surfaces to get the speed that you want if you want to be a production spinner or if you're an instant gratification spinner like some of us are. Um, look at your tools and really check them out. Um, I hope the person that asked me about the supported spindle bowls is watching because I hope that helped you. If you have any questions, let me know. It was kind of a little random and a little rattly, but you, you get the point. You get the point. The point is they're all gorgeous tools. You just need to pair them the way that works for you. A lot of um, new crafters think that they have to follow the rules and you don't. That's the thing about crafting is there are only rules if you put them on yourself. There, otherwise there are no rules. There are um, things that will help or they will hinder you, but you're not necessarily doing something wrong. You're only doing something wrong in that you're not getting achieving the result you want because you may not be using what you need to use or know how to do something that you need to know to achieve the result. But that is learning that is not wrong or even necessarily failure. It's just acquiring knowledge. At least that's what my grandma tells me. Right, Grandma? Hmm. So in terms of tools i posted recently on my instagram a couple of updates on different spinning projects and i thought i would show you what they actually look like in person so the first update was i had a beautiful braid of from wee chickadee jen of wee chickadee who i just i love her dying um BFL right here and this is what the trees know just straight BFL gorgeous gorgeous colors purples it goes from like light lilac-y to plummy and then it's even got a little touch of royal purple there is like a beautiful shade of Prussian blue in there and then all the beautiful green earth tones with touches it's got like a touch of pinkiness to it in certain parts but it's more of a um like when you thin raw umber out on a palette and it takes on that that um almost pink hue to it that's what this is it's gorgeous and i have been greatly enjoying spinning this up even with all the cat hair that's in it because the cat likes it too <laughs> um but this is all that is left of the first braid i purchased two braids because that's what i do i purchased two because i like making big projects and I don't like running out of fiber and I don't like running out of yarn, which means I buy enough to see me through whatever I think I want to make. Usually that requires eight ounces of fiber for me, just usually. And my mileage may vary. So this is the first cop that I finished. This turtle is fairly big. As you can see, it covers almost the whole of my palm, which is very large. <laughs> And this is just a simple single of what the trees know. And I spun this up on my Snyder Turk. So this is one of the first three Turkish spindles that I purchased. Um, this is by Scott Snyder. 
and it is gorgeous as you can tell it is I believe 0.8 or 0.9 grams and it is three ounces no no 25 grams 25 grams eight nine ounces somewhere around there um, and the set of canary wood and it's his glider model so if you pick this up you will not believe how light it is it's incredibly incredibly light and the arms are incredibly long as you can see this has been one of my go-to spindles for a very long time because i can pack a huge amount of fiber on here and still have room to pack more fiber on here i can't because the doctor said i can't but i could if i wanted to which is the important part so this is the first full cup that i finished however i also dug out my other Snyder spindles Turk. This is eight ounces and this is in Red Heart. And this has the other third of the What the Trees Know braid on it. Turtles or cops, whatever you call these, are lovely, stunning things to look at. So I love watching the colors change. There is a YouTube channel with Spinning Sarah, and I will link it below because it is fantastic, but um, she talks about building a wide cup, not a tall cup, and she teaches you to, when you're winding on and you're doing the God's Eye uh, to form the cup, teaches you to um, do two top layers and then flip your spindle over and do a bottom layer. So that is what you're seeing right there. That is the bottom layer. And you can pack far more on your spindle this way. Which makes life a little easier. More fiber on spindle means more unbroken spindle. Um, one thing you do have to be careful of is if you are using anything that is not a supported spindle, it, the more fiber you pack on it, the more weight there is. The more weight there is on your single, um, the more twist is needed to hold the single together. So when you are dealing with spinning something like this, you have to pay attention to the strength of your single and the amount of twist or the twist angle of your single as you are continually spinning. Uh, ooh, which reminds me, Hillary, I loved your question um, on the last episode because I have not gotten to talk to anyone about that in forever and it made me really really appreciate um, questions it really did so Hillary asked um, because of my watercolor braid uh, spin if it impacted if changing the style and type of spindle impacted um, the consistency of spinning and I have to tell you um, so this was the second spindle, Turkish spindle I ever purchased, but I, I, the one I got, the very first spindle I ever got, Turkish spindle, was from um, Scott, and it is currently housing a project, so you can't see it, but, but it is, um, it, it was a learning curve for me, and one of the things that happened with that spindle was I had finally learned how to spin on a Turkish spindle and I was excited and I was learning to spin on a drop spindle um, like a, a regular top roll drop spindle and was also doing a bunch of other things that I probably shouldn't have been trying to do all at once. The point was I spun a yarn on three separate spindles just spinning because what I knew how to do was to draft the fiber so it wouldn't break. Um, I didn't know how to do or how to gauge much else. And as I told Hillary, um, I used three separate types of spindles and I came out with three different types of singles. It looked like I had taken a braid of fiber and I had spun three separate types of singles for three separate projects. And 
Um, that had not been my intention. <laughs> my intention was to just spin up on these spindles, three separate singles and then ply them together. And that's when I found out that the style of spindle, the weight of the whirl, um, how you draft and how you change, how the amount of twist needs to change to hold things together based off of weight over time affects your work. <laughs> I was very, very disappointed. I was um, very sad because at that point in time, fiber, um, fiber was very expensive for me to buy. And so to have finished a full braid of this beautiful hand dyed fiber that I had been hoarding until I learned how to spin to only to have it turn into a huge chaotic mess was very disheartening for me. Um, as I told Hillary, now that I know how the difference in whorls, the difference in spindle designs affects the twist angle and structure of the single, it allows me now to spin a single on a supported spindle, spin a single on a Turkish spindle, spin a spindle, spin a single on a top whorl drop spindle, and they will all be consistent because I now understand um, that I need to check my yarn um, every once in a while and make sure that it has uh, a stable amount of twist in it, that if I'm going to do three separate singles, that it, they all have the same amount of twist and the same diameter in fiber, which is making sure to draft the right amount each time. And I also know the impact of, more so now, the impact of um, designs, spindle designs. For instance, these Turks are of different um, diameter. So you can see this one is smaller and more compact than this one, but they're almost the exact same weight. Um, however, when I spin with these, this one will spin long and fast for me because of the design of it. This is a Snyder glider. It's one of Scott's designs and he still sells this type of design. Um, and I can't remember for the life of me what type of design this is, if it's something different or not, but this one will spin for me, um, slow and long. So th this one will spin very, very fast and continue spinning for a long time. This one will spin um, at the same rate for, or it feels like for quite some time, um, but slower. There's a, a difference in the way that physics and dynamics and things like that, that I don't fully understand, but I remember from school <laughs> um, that impact that. It's uh, just like with a, um, with my watercolor braid as I was was uh, talking with Hillary, that watercolor braid, I'm using two separate types of spindle, three separate spindles all together. And one of the spindles is incredibly center weighted comparative, compared to the other two and spins very quickly, very fast and very long. And so with that one, I'm in danger of adding too much twist um, for the single to resemble the singles on the other two. However, the other two spindles tend to be, are a little bit bigger and more um, rim weighted. So they spin slower, but for a long amount of time. And learning to balance those out was an adventure. I could not have done that when I first started spinning. Um, but I feel like now I can handle that and have consistency among my singles. So if you ever wondered whether or not you can spin for one project on several different spindles, the answer is yes, but you need to be aware of different dynamics. Clear as mud, clear as mud. Thank you for listening in. If you skipped it, thank you for skipping it, not listening to me. Oh, today's a rambling day. What can I say? It's the day after inventory. Inventory was very stressful. My brain is kind of mushy right now. That's why I don't really mind the blizzard. I think that'll be fun, actually. Give us time to rest and relax. 
Anyway, you don't need to know that. What you do need to know is I picked up from Shannon, Beautiful Fiber Life, Etsy and Etsy and Instagram, if I remember correctly, these beautiful braids of beach glass, which are merino silk and flax, and they are drop dead gorgeous. They have like these cerulean turquoisey blues in them that look exactly like the shallows of the, the lakes that I go to and the lakes that I grew up by. And then it has these beautiful fawns, warm fawns with then these, these undertones of cool gray taupe almost in there. And they're just, they're heavenly. One thing I love about this um, merino silk flax blend is it is so incredibly textured. It is just a delight to work with. There is no way to get a perfect single from this. And it's delicious in the amount of joy that it brings me to spin with this and know that no matter how consistent or inconsistent my spinning, the single is just gonna be lively and full of texture and brightness and, and um, character that I really, really enjoy. So this um, particular blend is gorgeous, but this is also only one third. Um, I made a little mini braid of it to keep me and my cat from accidentally destroying it. So I don't know if you can actually see, maybe if you could. Yeah, you'll have to tell me later. Can you see the texture in there? So the light, lighter color is the silk. And then that almost grayish, well, weedy streak almost is the flax. And drafting this is so challengingly fun. Um, when I was a beginner, I would not have enjoyed this blend unless I was going for an art single. Now that I've been spinning for quite some time, um, this is something that brings the light to my soul because when you're trying to draft three different types of, of um, material together and they're all different all different characteristics so so think about it merino is so soft and just um smooth but warm at the same time then you have silk and silk is a little bit a little bit it's not rough silk is silk is smooth but drafting silk can be a little, on, on my fingertips, it can feel a little bit rough compared to drafting um, just wool, just, just regular animal protein fiber. And yet the silk blends so well with the wool, but there's still two different lengths. And then you throw flax in there on top of it. And both the silk and the flax, of course, have been, have been cut because they're not a continuous piece anymore. And you throw this, this flax, this linen in here, and it has its own way of drafting. So when you draft it with the silk and the wool, it, you have to catch it. I don't know a better way to explain that. When you're drafting, you have to make sure that just like it's, just like Stellina or, um, the other sparkly stuff or the little neps, whether they're cotton or acrylic neps that you've had to um, spin with before, you have to kind of catch them and entwine them in the single that you're creating so that they stay there, so that they don't fall out. Regular flax, when you're spinning it, you have to um, wet your fingertips somehow and spin it together while wet to help it to, um, I always thought of it as to make it stick together. <laughs> That's not the most accurate description, but to make it work, to make it into what we know of as linen, um, you have to wet it so that it clings correctly because it doesn't have 
scales like wool does. And so one of the things that I really, really enjoy about this is I love trying to um, draft equal amounts of the merino with the flax, with the silk, so that at the end they're all evenly combined. However, no matter how hard I try to do that, it still creates this just beautiful texture, textury goodness. I hope you can see this. So this is the first cob. It took me very little time to spin through this because like I said, I really, really enjoy this blend. But it is gorgeous how it has so much character. And yet the single itself, it doesn't, you know, it, I wasn't able to keep it perfectly um, stable in terms of diameter. But it didn't fluctuate all that much either. I don't know how well you can see that. Look at these colors. Aren't those just so beautiful? Don't those remind you of a beach? All the sandy tones. And that. Beach glass was an appropriate name for this. Oh, look. You can see the two layers. So I the, the blue layer, that cerulean color peeking through, that is the under layer of the Turk and then you can see that I did two top layers until I ran out of space on the spindle arms. So I am, this is the first one, I divided the braid into three because it was easier and this is, let's see if this will stay, this is the second third that I am working on and it is on this beautiful Enid Ashcroft Mini Turk. And this is out of Silver Birch and Cherry. Can't remember how much it weighs, but it's out of Silver Birch and Cherry. And this is what I am currently working on. I'm not really sure how I'm going to apply this. So, um, one of the things about how I spin um, is I don't think of flying when I should think of flying. Let's see if you can see this beautiful spindle better. Um, I don't think of flying when I should. I think of flying after the fact. And so this is essentially an ombre braid. Um, from end to end, it goes from the taupe, fawn, beachy colors through to the watery colors that cerulean and aqua and turquoise and then it goes back to those sandy tones and so i i know i don't want to do it as a complete ombre otherwise i would have spun the braid from end to end i want i want it to look like a beach in that i would like i don't want pure maybe at the very beginning i want pure strips of color But I don't want it to stay that way. Just like a beach, it moves back and forth. If you've ever seen those aerial shots of what beaches look like where they go through the different hues before they get out into the deep um, as you're looking from, from the top, I kind of want that effect in whatever I'm going to make with this. I'm assuming, based off of my nature and who I am, that I am probably going to make a shawl of some sort because I love knitting shawls, I like spinning for shawls, all the shawly things. What would you do? Are you are you an ombre person? That this always makes me wonder. Because I'm not I love ombre, but I don't want stripes. I like stripes in certain things. But I don't necessarily want stripes in everything. Hmm. Interesting. So, what do you do? You know, I love self-striping sock yarn, um, but they repeat. There are some beautiful sweaters that I've seen where they've used um, chain plied or Navajo plied a, a specific type of um, a, a, a gradient. 
of some sort of braid of fiber and it bring they put it into a sweater and use it for the color work and it's just gorgeous and it moves so beautifully and slowly from one color all the way through to the end of the other color and I think that's drop dead stunning. I'll have to see. There's someone, I don't know if it was an Andrew Young Lowry design or Caitlin Hunter. I'll have to look it up and put a picture in here. But someone did this gorgeous, gorgeous color work sweater. And someone else did a shawl. Oh, I hope I can find them and show you. I would do that, I think, in a heartbeat. But for something like this, for something with just a, um, just one specific single or one specific yarn knit all the way through, I don't think I would let, enjoy that as much knitting on that. We'll have to see. Send me your thoughts, please, and thank you. Okay, last thing I have to show you in this rambling, tired, I hope you're relaxed because I'm very relaxed. I don't think I have enough brain power to not be relaxed. Um, the last thing I have to show you is a little bit of knitting. And then I'm going to say bye so I can go bring wood in before it really starts to snow snow. Um, this is housed in my Bad Wolf Knits bag with its beautiful, beautiful hand embroidery. I have been slowly but surely working on one of my Bala Hoya socks. This is the January 22. I think it's 22. Maybe it's 21. It's one of the January Club colorways. Um, this is the one that is, it's this mushroomy base with the little flecks of um, raw sienna and burnt umber and I would say that there's, there's like this tiniest touch of orange in there that's pretty but it's got like all these mushroomy colors these grays and like those greeny grays it literally looks like if you put it under a tree that's growing moss with a bunch of mushrooms it would blend it right in anyway point being it's this this stunning colorway and I am knitting it up into a pair of socks surprise this is, of course, knit up on size 0 US or 2.0 millimeter sunstruck double pointed needles because DPNs are ride or die for me. <laughs> um, and I don't remember the stitch count, but this is the pattern. I just needed something very simple to keep my interest because the colors were beautiful and I didn't want to distract from that. So it's a basic chevron. I think it's like 29 or 27 stitches across and it has a little knit pearl rib to outline the outside because I felt like the chevron itself was not enough. I needed solid lines on either side of it. I actually went back and when I was about here, I just ripped back the single stitch all the way down and then picked it all the way back up in alternating knit and purl rib because I didn't want to rip the whole thing out. Oh, so sad, isn't it? I don't know where this cute little stitch marker came from. I cannot remember what Indie Dyer sent it, but it is beautiful. It's like a piece of orange cake. It's got a little tiny slice of orange right on the top with chocolate just looks so delicious like you could eat it and it complements these colors perfectly so in case you can't see the colors very very well hopefully this helps that gorgeous darling so I only got about an inch of progress on it but not bad not bad not not for 35 minutes of knitting no 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 20 20 minutes of knitting um, I'm going at my own pace, what can I say? It'll probably be another year before <laughs> I knit a complete pair of socks again. That just seems to be how this how this works. So I am slowly chugging away on that. How is your knitting going? Or your spinning? I know there are a couple of you who weave. I have not made much progress on mine. Um, it's the same thing, so I'm not gonna show you an update on it because it's the same pattern over and over again. But I do have an idea of what I want to do next when I get this scarf off the loom. And I will probably show you those plans and details sometime soon. Maybe. Life is much um, 
less busy now that the Christmas holiday season is over. Um, we are going into the Easter-ish season for where I work, so it will pick up again shortly, but I think I'll be able to pretty much talk to you hmm, once a month. We'll try and make it once a month. No promises, of course. No promises whatsoever. But I hope that you had a fun, relaxing time. I know that's what I use podcasts for, is to just relax and unwind and hear things and gain knowledge, but without being stressed out about it. So I hope that this provided that for you. If you have any questions or comments, please, please leave them below. Uh, it takes me forever to get back on here or on Instagram, but I will do it eventually. Just ask Hillary and all the other ladies. Thank you for those of you who have left comments. It's very encouraging. And I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day or evening, knitting, spinning, weaving, crocheting, whatever it is that you do. And please feel free to share pictures with me. I enjoy that as well. So I am going to leave you with this watercolor painting that I recently did that was inspired by the